but something I've been saying for many, 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 many weeks now is that we have a lot of bad habits built into us just from life. You know, as kids, flex your muscles, you know? Like, those muscles don't flex, they contract, joints flex. It's not to say those people are bad, <laughs> they just don't know, right? So you, you, we get these verbiages. Here's a good example of one. What joint is the movement in this shrug exercise? Where is that motion happening? Okay, and that's what we've been told our whole lives, but that's not happening in the shoulders. If that's happening in the shoulders, the shoulder would have to dislocate out of its socket, go up and down, and then snap back in. That's a, that's a scapula exercise. Right? <coughs> the shoulder goes along for the ride because it's articulating with the scapula, but you know what else is going along for the ride? The elbows. Why don't we call them elbow shrugs? The wrists going up and down too. Why don't we call them wrist shrugs? Next time you're doing this exercise with a friend, say, hey, can I get a set of these finger shrugs? I mean, they're going up and down too, okay? So it's an example of these illusions and this kind of brainwashing that we've been calling this shoulder for a long time. The shoulder can do what the hip does. Flex, extend, ab, add, internal, external, horizontal, ab, add. Nowhere in those options was shrug or elevation, as we're going to call it, and depression. So just another example of how these things can get misconstrued. Guys, the rule is now, I'm going to let one group in about three, four minutes, and then after that, if you're late, watch the video online, OK? I cannot be distracted with people coming in of late. So, please ask questions if you need, but I'm going to try to explain how the scapula and the shoulder work together, similarly, though not very similarly, as the pelvis and the hips. So, remember how our pelvis had rotations that would happen to help us get a little further up, or a little further forward. And if we had right hip abduction, let's say, and our left hip could kind of abduct, but our pelvis, because it rotated like this, it could get us a little higher. Right? When we take a step, what I mean by that in, in, in practice is if, I'm, if I'm, a, I'm not, but if I was a martial artist like my major professor and she was trying to kick as high as she can, right lateral would lift the left side up so that the abduction could be amplified through that pelvic girdle rotation and reach a little higher. Or when we step, I mentioned this in, with the, for the pelvic girdle rotation, as I internally rotate the right hip, it swings the left side forward and I can step further. It's like if you were walking and you tried to extend your steps, you would have much more pelvic girdle rotation to try to complement that stride length. So the pelvis already does this, assists our functional circle of gait. However, it's limited because it's connected to each other. If my right abducts, my left goes up. If my right comes down, my left goes down. The scapula is like literally taking the pelvis, because the scapula is the upper extremities version of the pelvis, or vice versa, and snapping it in two and having two independent moving sides of your pelvis. That's why they call it the shoulder girdle. Pelvic girdle, shoulder girdle. Now this independence of the scapula can lead to some really cool, interesting, and useful things. If my scapula were to move like the pelvis, meaning right transverse pelvic girdle rotation, the right side and the left side have to both move, right? In this case, right goes back, left goes forward. The scapula, to do the same thing, it would have to do something like this.
bike goes back, left goes forward. Let me see if I can do it at the same time. I should get like a cookie or something. I'm trying to do this movie. But they don't have to do that. My right can independently go forward and back. My left can independently go up and down. So they are not bound by the sacroiliac joint connecting one side to the other. They can independently do similar things as the pelvis. But just because my right does something doesn't mean my left has to. However, the function is still similar. Assist our functional circle of reach. Classic example that I give in class is, you know, if all I did to reach forward was move my shoulder joints, my glenohumeral joint, the ball and socket in my upper extremity, flex, 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 flex. flex. <coughs> Look at all the extra motion my scapula gives me. That's all the right side of my shoulder girdle orbiting the ribs to help me go further forward, help me reach further back, help me reach forward up, help me reach forward down, and I'm going to show you to reposition the socket so that I can get my clock hand as much to 12 o'clock as possible. So in other words, when you reach overhand like this, that's not all shoulder joint. You'd run out of real estate. Your clock literally has to rotate, not just the clock hand, the clock to get your um, hand, the clock hand to 12. I'm gonna show you how that works. I'm, I'm setting up where we're going to, okay? So the first thing before we get into motions is to separate, to differentiate shoulder joint, glenohumeral joint from scapula, okay? So what composes the shoulder girdle? The shoulder girdle is a little different than the pelvic girdle because of the mobility, the trade-off of mobility and stability. Lots of stability in the hip and pelvis, which makes sense. We need stability. We need a ground rock to build our skyscraper on top of. And as I mentioned before, if you dislocate your shoulder, it's a bad day. But congratulations, you still get to run away from danger. If you dislocate your hip, you better hope that you have a good support system. Nowadays, we live in good times, relatively speaking, compared to ancient history is what I'm getting at. It's not that life is full of daisies and roses. But our ancestors, if you dislocated a hip, you were a liability. <laughs> you were, it was, it was difficult if you had that. So we protect it with things like a big socket, extra ligaments, these big strong muscles. For our upper extremity, we needed to hunt. We needed to kill from a distance. Our prey throwing spears, throwing laterals to be able to sling things, rocks. We needed to be able to move. And the cost of movement is instability. That is the cost of movement. How many of you played a sport that involved any kind of throwing at all? Javelin, baseball, football. Huh? The cost of movement is instability. Much more likely to have a shoulder dislocation than a hip dislocation. Much more likely to have shoulder problems than hip problems. So one of the ways we get this extra mobility is we lessen the socket, still a socket, shoulder joint is still a ball and socket. It's not as much of a socket, but it's like a golf tee. That's still a socket. And the golf ball, same. In addition, we don't have these big, thick ligaments. We still have ligaments, but they're definitely not as big and thick as in the hips. 
and then we don't have the musculature like we do in the hips for stability. What we gain in one, we lose in the other. The scapula, though, that's really where a lot of magic happens in our upper extremity movement. And my job is to teach you what is scapular and what is glenohumeral, what is shoulder and what is shoulder girdle. I'll give you an example. If you're doing a, a row exercise, let's say a bent over row. Let me pull it up to make sure we're all on the same page. Oh, and also guys, Campbell's not saying like, you need to correct every person that ever says shoulder shrugs. It's just that you see how that word gets in our brains and it's logical to think, well, that must be shoulder movement. It's a shoulder shrug. Just giving you an example. All right, so check this out. If somebody were to, let's see if I can, this, make sure you don't move. Ugh, utilizing the chair. What I'm trying to teach you guys, or, or for you to see, is that globally, the purpose of this exercise is to bring the dumbbell up. Globally, dumbbell goes up, dumbbell comes down, right? However, what brings it up? What brings it up? This part of bringing it up was all my shoulder girl. That was all scapular. That had nothing to do with my shoulder joint at all. My arm stayed straight. This part is all scapula. This part is shoulder extension. Shoulder flexion. And I'm going to show you what it is. Scapular protraction. Gonna, we're going to go into the, to the movements in a little bit. But I want to show you the difference between scapular shoulder. Shoulder, scapula, that's a big assist. And so if you are, why is this important? Your personal trainer, therapist, athletic trainer, coach. Sometimes you need other muscles at other joints to help build momentum. Like if you're trying to crank a, a lawnmower that's, that, that's being stubborn, you kind of want to make sure you get that trunk going, that scapula going, and that shoulder going, okay? I'm not saying you should never do this. However, if you wanted to target something, if you're really just trying to work a certain muscle that's influencing the shoulder only, why would you want to create momentum and then transfer that momentum into the shoulder muscles? So what I mean by that is next time you do this exercise, maybe you're going to do it today or tomorrow, try to separate those two movements so that you can feel and see the difference, because if you don't, it all kind of looks like the same thing. It all kind of looks like a shoulder if you move it all at the same time. But usually the scapula generates the momentum and then the shoulder movement transfers that momentum and makes it easier. So separate those two. Use momentum twice. Use your scapula to retract it and then stop. And then just use the shoulder to win. And I think you'll be able to be like, oh, that's a big difference. And it'll help you to see the difference between shoulder and scap. Okay. So now I'm going to define what the shoulder girdle is, and we'll get into the specific muscles of the. But before I do that, any questions? Of just the overview of what we're getting at. Okay. So the shoulder girdle itself. Pelvic girdle, we had fused joints. We didn't really have to go into movement of that. They're fused. Uh, the, 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 the pubic bones have a slight movement between one and the other, but not significant enough to give it motion. The sacroiliac, so you had these different articulations in the pelvic girdle, but they're not meant to move significantly. These are, okay, these are. So there are similarities but there are also differences. The first, there are four major joints. All of this is in, should be in your note packet under scapula. 
But the first joint of the shoulder girdle is the glenohumeral joint. That is the shoulder joint. That's the ball and socket joint. That's the one flexion, extension, ab, ad, it, at the same motions as the hip. Same movements as the hip. Okay. So that would be like uh, the MVP of the shoulder girdle articulations. That's the synovial uh, triaxial ball and socket. But then you have these other joints. In the shoulder girdle, you have the sternoclavicular joint. Pretty simple enough. There's your sternum, and there's your clavicle, and where they articulate is the sternoclavicular joint. This joint has significant motion. Unlike the pubis, where like you have the left and the right articulating together, here you have this manubrium of the, of the, of the um, sternum that separates them enough so that they're independent of each other. That's how you get the independence. And when you elevate and depress, the collarbone does like this. And when you protract and retract, the collarbone does like this. And when you, we're gonna get to it, but when you upward and downward rotate, the collarbone actually rotates like this. It kind of mimics some of the things happening with the shoulder joint itself, the glenohumeral joint. The sternoclavicular joint is actually the attachment that connects your upper extremity to your thorax, I mean, to your, your, your trunk, right here. <coughs> Most commonly broken bone in the body, right here. As kids, we used to chop pencils. Remember your kids, like ninja chop? There's a big long pencil right there, just waiting to get chopped. The collarbone, I like to think of it as passing a baton, passes the baton to the scapula here, the acromioclavicular joint. Now the acromion is a prominent bony landmark of the scapula. Bony landmarks aren't independent bones, they're just areas. Acadiana is an area of Louisiana. Simple. Okay? The Mississippi Delta is an area of Mississippi. So the acromion is that hook. God, sometimes I wish they wouldn't have attached this femur. We'll make it work. This little hook part. So this is actually part of the scapula. Okay? but it's that hook part that comes here. You have different parts. You have the spine of the scapula, the coracoid process. I mean, it's all part of the same bone. Um, medial, lateral, malleoli, uh, lateral, condyle, just areas of bone, okay? So the acromioclavicular joint, right here. What this joint does is it's kind of like a, a, a pivot joint where you're not going to have this because that would be dislocation. You don't want to have this because that would be dislocation. But what you will have is a lot of spin. You'll have a lot of rotation there. As the scapula wants to do this, you have to accommodate that upper rotation by spinning the scapula, I mean uh, spinning the collar. So there's going to be rotation. Has anybody ever had a sprain AC joint? where you get hit directly. They may even call it a shoulder sprain, but it's your AC joint, and that's why it hurts so much, because when you lift your arms up, that <laughs> those two bones are rotating about each other, it causes pain. So that's three, glenohumeral, sternoclavicular, acromioclavicular, and then the last one is not a true joint, we call it an articulation. And I know what you're saying. Aren't joints articulation? Yes. Yes. But they also have other factors. Um, you guys may not be old enough. Maybe you are. I don't mean to assume your age. It's just I'm getting older, and it's harder to remember. Y'all remember when Pluto was declassified as a planet? That was a big deal, man. And my whole childhood was ruined. But... They had criteria. They were like, well, its orbit isn't independent. In other words, it crosses into Neptune's orbit. In other words, it doesn't have enough stuff, and it's part of a 
a larger belt of other big rocky objects and, and it, it just it just didn't meet the criteria. So it's very similar. The last joint slash articulation is the scapula thoracic articulation. Literally how the scapula floats and moves about our ribs. Now, why isn't it a joint? Because joints, to get the J word, that's where you have a synovial sac, like a water balloon, and you have synovial fluid, and you have a bone moving about another. You have all these criteria. The scapula literally floats. I like to think of it as like the scapula is like a satellite and the heart is like planet Earth, and it's like floating around and orbiting around. Now, it all connects to joints, but how the scapula floats is very unique. It's held together up against the thorax with negative pressure. In physiology, y'all may have heard like uh, how the lungs work, the pneumothorax, and you, you can, you know, when you, puncture a lung, you mess with the pressure gradients and stuff. It, it's held together with negative pressure, like a suction cup and muscles. However, we all have that one friend that at the party, they're like, man, check out my, and they do like that little trick and they can put your hand up underneath it, right? That's to show you that it's not connected like a traditional synovial joint. You know what I'm talking about? The people that can take their hands and wedge it up. Okay. So it's similar, you have bone moving about other bones but it's different enough where it doesn't get the same classification as a knee joint, an ankle joint, a shoulder joint, okay? Phase one of this game is to try to show you how functionally these two joints, um, the shoulder, the glenohumeral, and the scapula thoracic are 1A and 1B in our functional circle. How high can we reach? How low can we reach? How much? How forward? Back. Tremendously important. And the secret, in my opinion, to look at is how the scapula moving about the thorax literally repositions the entire shoulder joint. Think about it. The socket is part of the scapula. So if I can bring the whole socket forward, it's going to bring the whole joint forward. However, just because the whole joint goes forward doesn't mean I had shoulder motion. That would be like saying my elbow goes forward and back, but I didn't have flexion and extension. You see what I'm saying? My wrist is going forward and back, but I didn't have all our radial deviation. So just because you might see the shoulder joint itself move doesn't mean you had shoulder motion, flexion, extension, ab, ad, internal. Okay. Let's start here. The positive about the shoulder joint movements is you've had them already. At the hip, there's going to be some illusions. There's going to be a lot of illusions, but at least the verbiage should be in your vocabulary. Flexion gets you into fetal. Extension gets you out of fetal. ESPN has been lying to you all these years. As I've said before, I think what they mean to say when they say full extension for a diving catch is the elbow is fully extended, but the shoulder is flexed. But the elbow was probably extended before the play even started. So it's not like the elbow, you know, it's not like they were here. And then they fully extend it. I mean, it's, so the extension thing gets in our minds like the shoulder stroke thing was on. Shoulder flexion. Think about this. The, to me, the easiest way to see these, if you got the hip down, follow the hip. Ab, add. Internal, external, follows the same rules. Flexion, extension. So if you get confused, just follow the same movements of the hip. The internal and external will mess with you. 
but I'm going to explain why. Okay? If I were going to be an anatomical, I'm going to try to do a similar movement. So I'm going to flex my wrist to represent a foot. Kind of see what I'm trying to do here? Internal, external. Okay. The problem where students will get confused is when you're spinning something, I'm going to pretend that I'm like in Star Wars or something, and I'm spinning my, my little staff. This whole pipe has the same spin, yes or no? Yes? But with rotation comes a coupling where linearly the top part is going to your left, but the bottom part is going to your right, but they have the same spin. Okay, that messes with you. So what I mean by that is if I have both of my hips, I'm sorry, my left hip flexed and my left knee flexed, notice how my lower leg would be like the bottom part of this pipe. Then I'm gonna flex my left shoulder and I'm gonna flex my elbow. Well, now that's like the top part of the pipe. And when I have internal rotation of both, my hand goes to your left, but my foot goes to your right. But it has the same spin. I did not think I was going to be able to do that when I fall over. Okay. But I, if I could do a cartwheel, I could do anything. This is why, guys, you want to say this is external rotation because you see foot go by. The knee flexes posteriorly, but the elbow flexes anteriorly. And shoulder motion isn't about the position of anything other than the position change of the shoulder. Does that make sense? Okay. It's all about the spin of the joint we're analyzing. The radial ulna joint is going to work with the shoulder joint for a lot of things too. We'll get into that lesson on Friday. So, let's go over our basic motions of our shoulder joint. Lino humeral, ball and socket, okay? And I'm gonna try to minimize my scapular contribution, okay? Internal, external. So from anatomical, ab ba 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 ab da 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 flexion extension internal external. Here is a common mess up. We talked about it in the hips, but it's more prominent in the shoulders because you got more motion. I didn't go all the way up because I was trying to not move my scapula. Some of you have learned things <coughs> like abduction is movement away from the midline. That's all fine until it's not. I'll give you an example. Right shoulder. Ab, 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 ab. Well, Campbell, you're going away from the midline. I know, just keep watching. Ab, 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 clockwise and this is counterclockwise, we wouldn't say clockwise is away and then counterclockwise is two. It's the same spin. Yes? Came with the big guns today. We wouldn't say this is ab and then that's ad. Ab, away, add to, no, that's the same spin. That's clockwise the whole time. Ab, ab. Just more of it. Or, or think about how silly this would be. Show me bilateral shoulder adduction, no problem. Isn't that ridiculous? Just my opinion, but it's not your fault if you were taught ab is away from midline. So that's why I'm trying to recondition your brain 
to see the movements for what they are. Rotations, spins, has nothing to do with linear concepts. It has everything to do with rotational concepts. Okay? Add all the way up, all the way down. Okay? So shoulder, flexion, extension, ab, add, internal, external. Then we have the variation more prominent in our shoulders than in our hips of the horizontal ab and add. This would be horizontal ab, ba, 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 ba. this would be horizontal ad. Da, 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 da. Okay. Ab, ba, 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 ba. Add, da, da, da. Or another way to look at it is if I were going to do like the block, go around the block. Add, ba, 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 ba. Horizontal add, da, 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 and then the extension rope to give it back. So in other words, if I add, I got to add, whether I go frontal or trunks transverse, I got to add, did it back to be able to get back to us. If that helps. Okay. Scapular motion. Elevation and depression. That is when, that is what's happening during a shrug. Scapula elevation and depression. That's your whole shoulder girl and everything that's attached to it going along for the ride, up and down, okay? Now, not legally, but I feel like it's a state. Legally, I have to tell you, it's not literally just going straight up and down. I mean, it has to angle. It has to angulate here. The reason your hands can kind of go straight up and down is because as your scapula is doing this, your shoulder is compensating by doing that. So, in other words, as you elevate, your shoulder is actually adducting, because if your shoulder would stay in anatomical and you elevated, your arms would actually go out here. So that's the illusion of like my hands go up and down or the dumbbells are going up and down. It's because you have canceled motion. We did this the other day, throwing a jab. You gotta cancel out the elbow and the shoulder to make your hand go straight. Same thing, just apply the different. Elevation and depression, the ups and the downs. The scapula can also orbit forward and back. We call that protraction and retraction. Think of like progress. Going forward, moving forward. Retraction, I like to think of it as retracting a bow. If you had like a, if you were like shooting a bow and average, you want to be cool when you put it on the side. You'd be like retracting the bow, okay? That helps your shoulders get further across or in front of you. So if I was trying to reach across my body and all I did was use my glenohumeral joint, Look at all that extra motion my scapula gives me by repositioning the socket. Okay? Or going back, trying to reach back, your scapula can reposition itself to retract so that you can reach further back. You know how they say in sport, you know, life's our sports a game of inches, you know, so close to catching it or blocking it or whatever. For our ancestors, like life was a game of inches. So I mean, every little bit, reaching fruit, you know, hunting, gathering, grabbing, working, being able to put our hands in as many points as possible, all matters, okay? The trickiest one that I'm gonna introduce you to today, and we will develop this concept on Wednesday, is your shoulder joint the glenohumeral joint, only had, I say only, it's still significant, but about 120 degrees of abduction. So watch, let me show you what I mean by that.
So what I mean by that is, let's say your shoulder is at six o'clock, okay? This would be 90. Another half would be 135, so that's a little bit too, too far, so about right there. That's as much shoulder abduction as you have before you run out of golf ball on golf team. So how do we get the arm and the hand over our head to 180? We literally take the clock and we do this with the clock so that the clock hand globally is 180. Huh? Yeah or no? And this motion of the clock literally moving so that the clock hand can get up over the top is what scapula upward rotation is. It's literally the scapula repositioning the socket so that the arm could get overhead. All right, I need a volunteer, someone who has no shoulder problems, anybody at all. I need a volunteer. I'm not going to embarrass you. I don't think I will. I'm not going to have you do a cartwheel. Oh, you guys are a hoot. Come on. I think I have shoulder problems. You do? I don't think I do. Okay, we're about to find out. No, I'm just okay. Are you right or so watch what we're going to do. We're going to do this little trick, okay? Uh, regular range of motion. And I see you got the Mimoto wet red today, okay? So red, regular range of motion all the way up, okay? So all the way up, right, globally to 180. Now watch what happens when I limit your scapular motion. Can I press down right here to try to limit your scapula? Former athletic trainer. Now abduct your shoulder. Now you notice I'm not pulling on your, your shoulder bone, right? I'm pulling on your scapula to prevent it. Go up, go up, go up, go up, go up, go up, go up. Keep going. <laughs> it's crazy, huh? Okay, so watch. Turn around. We're gonna do, do like, so here's your scapula, left and right, okay? My hands will represent your scapula. Let's do the shrug, like up and down. See the elevation and the depression, okay? Elevation. Depression. So if you were gonna reach overhead like you're trying to grab something from the pantry, go up a little higher, like you scapula, get a little bit higher. Okay, come back down. Okay. Now we're gonna go forward like a sh like a um like you're rolling your shoulders forward and back. Okay. Protraction, retraction, protraction, retraction, and then this is the upward and downward rotation. This is the clock hand and the clock moving to get the hands up over your head. Okay, slowly bring your arms up as high as you can. Okay, back down. Excellent. Excellent. It's not like you need, but just in case. You see what's happening there? Wasn't that cool? Like to be able to be like, whoa, what the heck is happening? I can't move my shoulder anymore. It's because we limited your scapula being able to reposition. There are um there are people that understand and know these things that will try to use it against your knowledge. I will give you an example. I was at a conference one time, and I was a, a young doctoral student in biomechanics, and I had a good knowledge of how the body worked and the body moved from my education here. Dr. George, who taught this class for 30 years before I was lucky enough to take his place, um, he, he taught me what I'm teaching you now. That's why I'm very passionate about it. This stuff predates like before this building came. And so we're at this conference and this guy is trying to sell me this, you know, um, snake oil stuff, right? Whether it was a bracelet or a hologram or some oils or something. Nothing to get told. But being inquisitive, I'm like, so how does it work? And he's like, oh, it, you know, I forgot. But he basically said, I'll show you. And my friends were here, and I was the subject. And he got in the way of my, my friends being able to view him and my arm. And he pressed down on my scapula. He, he, he was supplying oppressive force on my scapula. 
And he's like, look how limited your shoulder range of motion is. And then he gives me whatever the little hologram was, and he's like, put that in your back pocket. And then when he did it again, he allowed my scapula to elevate. He's like, look at all that extra motion you just got by using my hologram. And I was like, oh my God, that's amazing. Let's talk. So it's not just about helping people. It's knowing how the body works and moves so that you don't fall victim to some of these anti <laughs> knowledge people that are trying to sell you uh, a, a, you know, snake oil. So that can happen as well. But that's what's happening, guys. And it's super hard to differentiate. But I'm just telling you on the test, I just want you to know that all of this isn't just happening here. That's, that's, that's the main thing. That 180 degrees of abduction isn't all shoulder abduction, okay? That socket, that scapula has to help, and that's how it helps. It literally leans. What do you mean by that, Campbell? Well, I always use the right side. Most people are right-handed. But imagine if this was my shoulder out at 90 degrees, but instead of leaning my scapula, I wanted to lean my trunk. Couldn't I lean to the left and my arm go up higher? So that's what the scapula is doing. The scapula is just leaning. It's, it's, when it upwardly rotates, it's just leaning so that the whole arm goes along for the ride. Make sense? So, summary. I'm introducing you to these concepts. I have zero expectation that you'll be able to know all these different trick, we're gonna practice that, okay? I need, you know what I need you to do? I need you to, to study these names, get the names into your head, memorize the names so that when we do some practice, it'll be better absorbed, you'll be able to develop and master these concepts. So, what is shoulder? Flexion, extension, Ad adduction, internal, external rotation, Horizontal AB and AD, which is a variation about the trunk's transverse plane. What is scapula? Elevation, depression, protraction, retraction, upward and downward rotation. Cool? All right, guys, you have a good day. It's almost kind of like the scapula has the most movement because it has the muscles yanking on it. And then because it's almost like reverse engineering it. Instead of going proximal to distal, you say, okay, the scapula is moving all around and what's connecting it to the thorax is like this, this baton mm -hmm. that's being passed here. So it's almost like it moves inconsequentially. 
Okay. <laughs> Does that make sense? Yeah. So like because we're yanking on the scapula back, it's just going for the rod, as opposed to like muscles that are just pulling on the ulna making the elbow move. This one almost like moves because the scapula is going around. Let me research that for you and get back to you. Thank you so much. It's a great question. Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank no, you. I do was that helpful? Yeah, yeah, no, because like I don't know, like in PT or MLO PT yeah, clinic, yeah. we always be talking about how shoulder injuries and stuff like yeah. that, but no one ever said like the scapula actually really do more than huge, huge. So I think absolutely. that's why like with rotator cuffs and stuff like that, is that why they be doing like so much like all these motions like yeah. that? Is that why yeah. is to try to the, get that motion the, back? The, 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 there's there's a little bit more at play with the with the rotator. Mm -hmm. um, the growth of the because we don't have any extra stability there, our rotator cuffs kind of functions as um, stability. Um, and so what? But they're muscles, and muscles have to respond to innervation, and sometimes we're tired or we make mistakes. And so, in other words, a ligament's always going to be. A suck, it's always going to be there. But these muscles have to respond to, a, you know, a command. So sometimes we don't send a command in time. Sometimes, you know, it's, and so what can happen is, too, in the shoulder, is that, I say the shoulder is a big city living. You have brachial plexus, all these different nerves. So we can afford to have these muscles that are living in the big city grow too big. Like, you're not going to have a pet that's going to be too big when you live in the city. Your pet has to be small. So we, so we, uh, your chest lives out in the country, it can get big. Your hamstrings and your quads, all these different country living muscles can get big, but these can't because we have all these different. So that's why they're prone to weakness, is because we don't innervate them as much. So doing these rotator cuff muscles not only can kind of train them to kind of be extra stabilizers, but because they won't get the blood supply that these kind of different muscles do. Uh, you know, sometimes they can get weaker at a faster rate because they just aren't getting the nutrition that other muscles do. You, know, you can't have these muscles get too hypertrophy. Yeah, 100%, yeah. And vessels, and blood vessels, and, and uh, thoracic outlet is a uh, thing. So, so we try to minimize, so it's almost kind of like, it's, it's, a, it's a really tough, it actually lends itself for the, the contraindication of, you want to have mobility, right? Well, I've got to take something away. Oh, you want to have stability now? Yeah. So, so this is the cost of stability, um, that we have muscles that don't have the blood supply, um, don't have the natural tones of the muscles that are trying to basically translate that golf ball on that golf team. And what's really cool, this is where most of the impingement happens, is um, here. You know, if you hit that neck muscle that goes to like, the top of it. So what the hip does is when you use these leg muscles, you have a force couple, the socket pushes the head down. And so while the socket is pushing the head down, you have the other muscles that can pull up, right? Force couple. Here, if you don't want the impingement to push it down, because you got a muscle that holds up. So the bulk of those rotator cuff muscles is to pull the head down while you're deltoid to the muscles. But it, yes, a force couple. Um, if we're trying to spin the merry-go-round, it works best if you go push that one this way, and not push this one in the opposite linear direction, but you get the same spin. So if those rotator cuff muscles can't draw that head down in, the humerus will actually translate up Chromium will push it back. Something's got to push that down. But when you start pushing it down with the chromium, you start pinching it back and pushing it back. Yeah, it's Pinch the second pinch, but if you're 
to get hurting and your biceps are oh, I guess I gotta do more. And then all of a sudden your biceps yeah, you're welcome. Thank you for <laughs> thank you for your help. Thank you. You're welcome.